This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee. Available at HollywoodBlends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is part of Pop Music Royalty. He was a founding member of one of the most popular and beloved vocal groups in music history, The Seekers. With their signature fusion of folk and pop, their addictive instrumentations and perfect harmonies, and the amazing lead voice of Judith Durham, the Seekers were the first Australian music group to achieve global superstardom, selling well over 50 million records worldwide and giving us such unforgettable songs as I'll Never Find Another You, A world of our own. Close the door, light the light. We're staying home tonight. Far away from the bustle and the bright city lights. Let them all fade away. Just leave us alone and we'll live in a world of our own. Morningtown Ride. The carnival is over. Someday, one day. Georgie Girl. Hey there, Georgie Girl. Swinging down the street so fancy free. Nobody you meet could ever see the loneliness there. Inside you. When will the good apples fall? My personal favorite, Walk With Me. Walk with me through the long and lonely night. Walk with me and my world is filled with light. Here I stand, feeling lost and so and so many more. After the Seekers disbanded in 1968, our guest founded the New Seekers, who achieved worldwide success in the early 70s with hits including Never Ending Song of Love, I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing, You Won't Find Another Fool Like Me, Look What They've Done to My Song Ma, and Beg, Steal, or Borrow. In 1992, the Seekers reunited for their Silver Jubilee, and they toured internationally for many years and recorded two platinum-selling albums 
Future Road, and Morningtown Ride to Christmas. And in 2019, our guest, along with original members Athel Guy and Bruce Woodley, and with the addition of longtime producer, guitarist, and singer Michael Cristiano, released an album as the original Seekers, entitled Back to Our Roots. There's also a wonderful live concert DVD entitled The Seekers Golden Jubilee Farewell Tour. And most recently, a three CD compilation was released to mark the group's 60th anniversary, featuring the group's very last recording, Carry Me. Our guest as a member of The Seekers has a prestigious, prominent, and permanent place in music history. The Seekers were honored as Australians of the Year in 1967, the only group to have been given this acknowledgement. They've been inducted into the Australian Recording Industry Association Hall of Fame and the Music Victoria Hall of Fame. And in 1995, they were awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia. In 2012, the Seekers were honored by the Australian Post Office with their own postage stamp. In 2013, the Seekers received the Ted Albert Award from the Australian Performing Rights Association for outstanding services to Australian music. And in 2014, our guest, along with his fellow group members, was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia. But quite apart from all of that, our guest has had a highly successful career as a songwriter, record producer, and solo performer. He's released three solo albums, Secrets of the Heart, Sunday, and Smile Now. And he continues to perform in concert to sold out wildly enthusiastic audiences. I am delighted and honored to welcome Keith Potker to our show. Keith, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure, Harvey. And thank you very much for doing that roll call of uh, all the achievements that the group and uh, the New Seekers have managed to achieve. That, that's fantastic. I, I, love, I love hearing that stuff, especially from somebody else. <laughs> well, I loved saying it. Now, I want to start by paying tribute to the fabulous Judith Durham, whom we lost last year. Her glorious voice contributed so much to those magnificent recordings. You must have been devastated when she passed away. Indeed, indeed. There was a, a lead up to it, of course. These things don't happen overnight. But uh, so we, we knew that, that, that Judith was, was failing in health and we were all very close to her. And indeed, on that last, last day, both, all of us, Athel, uh, Bruce and myself, we all managed to have a sep separate conversations with her and to tell her how much we loved her and how much she was an incredible part of our life. And yes, it's, it's been uh, it, it's certainly devastating, but now I like to look on it as being one of those or incredible, not just one, but a huge number of those incredible memories that bring a smile to our face. And uh, I think that's the way Athel and Bruce look at it as well. Tell me about how the song Carry Me, which started out as a solo by Judith, turned into a full-blown Seekers production, thanks to the miracle of technology. Well, yes, it's amazing. It, it was written by Bruce Woodley in 1995, and he, he recorded it pretty much as a demo. And Judith happened to be around, and she sang a vocal on it, and that was, that was how it, it started off. And for some unknown reason, it just hung around in the archives until April of last year. And our great historian and friend, Graham Simpson, dug it up and he said, he played it to Judith and, and she was really happy with her vocal. And so remember, this is April last year and after so many, nearly a couple of decades. And, uh, and then, then he played it to Athel and Bruce and me and we loved what she had done on it. And, and so we added our guitars and uh, double bass and I arranged some harmonies for the, for the lads and we put our vocals on and it became a, a finished product thanks to Michael Cristiano, who, who was our record producer and a magician, in fact. You know, he, he brings all these things to life and it, it, it's lovely that uh, it was finished in May of last year and we were able to play it to uh, to Judith and she loved the final recording so it was it was such a treat that the the whole project came to be our final recording and uh, that we all had such a uh, such an integral part in the final result even though it took you know 18 years to, to do it
The song was played at the memorial service for Judith in September 2022. That must have been a very emotional moment. Well, yes, it certainly was. Ethel and, and Bruce and I made our uh, eulogy uh, speeches to the, the the audience at the memorial, and then uh, that was that was towards the end. And then the the final the final curtain was, in fact, uh, to play the song "Carry Me," and it, it was extraordinarily emotional for all concerned. Uh, there were friends, relatives, people from the press. Oh, there was a there was a huge contingent who just came in from Melbourne because it was open to the public, and it was a full house to uh, to say farewell in that memorial to to our beloved little sister. There's a biography by Graham Simpson called "The Judith Durham Story: Colors of My Life." What did you think of the book? I liked it. I thought that uh, it was it was a great way of of recounting some of those amazing amazing uh, periods that we went through and it was a kind of what's an all uh, biography which which we all which we all loved and in fact uh, then graham revised it and so it was it was made up to date and now of course there'll be a, another revision but uh, but nevertheless it was a, it's a great book keith i want to take you back to your youth when you were growing up what kind of music did you like listening to well, I liked listening to rock and roll, and it was it was all around me at that time. But I loved harmony singing, and I grew up in a household that had lots of lots of seventy eight records of big band music, Glenn Miller and and Benny Goodman and people like that, Artie Shaw, and I loved all of that as well. And that suddenly s- sort of came to become the platform of the the music that I was listening to. So so I had rock and roll on one hand and and big band music on the other. But in uh, in all of those genres, I I generally tended to focus on the ones that had harmony singing in them. So so of course the you know the, those big bands had their had their their groups, the modern airs and, and groups like that. And of course rock and roll, there were the uh, there were the four lads and there were the the four preps and the Everly brothers. And so I just gravitated towards harmony. Well, now you started out in a quartet of four young men called the Escorts. And when one of the men left the group to get married, you decided to replace him with a woman. What gave you the idea to add a female voice to the group? Well, the the Escorts disbanded, actually. We had a, a period of television success in Australia and that wasn't a lot enough to keep us alive. So we disbanded and decided to go back to our day jobs. And in that group was uh, Ken Ray. And I, I uh, joined forces with Athel Guy at that stage again, because we had, we had lost contact for a little while. And by that time, Athel had met up with Bruce Woodley. And so when Ken and I joined together with with Bruce Woodley and Athel Guy, we decided that we needed a new name. So, as luck would have it, we decided on the Seekers. And it was, uh, there were two names that we we had thought about. One was the Seekers and the other was the Searchers. And upon agreeing that we all loved the, the word the Seekers, it was only about 10 days later that the English group, the Searchers, whom we'd never heard of, had this mammoth hit with Sweets for My Sweet. And so we were very lucky. But anyway, yes, as you said, Ken Ray decided to, to leave the group and get married. But he had a fantastic voice, a really wonderful high falsetto, as well as his natural uh, high baritone voice. And so when he decided to leave, we thought, OK, let's get another high voice. Uh, who's another high voice? Well, let's get a girl. And Judith Durham was singing jazz around the Melbourne uh, jazz clubs. This is trad jazz, not modern jazz. Trad jazz clubs in Melbourne. And as, again, as luck would have it, she came to work in the advertising agency that Athel Guy was an account director of, J. Walter Thompson. She came in as a secretary. And Athel sidled up to her desk and said, hey, Judith, we know about you. (laughs) And would you like to join Bruce Woodley, Keith Potker and me at a coffee lounge, uh, Treble Clef, it was called, in a little cafe in, um, on the outskirts of Melbourne. 
And yeah, bless her little heart, she said yes. So that Monday night, we used to do Monday nights at the coffee lounge. And that Monday night, she came along and sang with us for the first time. And that was in December 1962. The Seekers had such a distinctive sound. Some music critics said you were too pop oriented to be considered strictly folk and too folk to be rock. Did that bother you at all that people were trying to label you and pigeonhole you? Well, it confused us a little bit because we we were just doing music that we loved. And it was it was one of those kind of take it or leave it because we believed in what we were doing. And it just the those categories that people have uh, and it's, it's got even worse now lately with all the rap and stuff that's going on but it, it didn't bother us Harvey no we we just got on with the business and, and we loved making our music and luckily lots of people out there loved it as well well that would be an understatement you've had so many amazing moments as a performer Keith and I want to touch on some of them starting with April 11th 1965 on that day oh. The Seekers performed at Wembley on the same bill with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Animals, Cliff Richard, and Dusty Springfield. You had just been named Best New Group in the UK. What was going through your mind when you took the stage that night? Oh, it was was an incredible honour to be uh, included in that. And we'd, we'd really only been in England for a year by that time. And so to be on the same stage as those all those illustrious acts that that you've just mentioned was was such a, an incredible thrill and we were able to play for the first time the the song that followed i'll never find another you that that gave us that first number one in england i think the first time the north american public saw you on tv at least the first time i remember seeing you on tv was in june of 1965 when you appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. You sang A World of Our Own and You Can Tell the World. I'll never forget it. We could see how excited you were to be there. Do you have any memories of that night that you can share? Yes, I have very clear memories. It was wonderful being on the Ed Sullivan Show because, I mean, that was that was an, an, an unbelievable audience to, to sing in front of anyway, you know, millions and millions of viewers. And Ed Sullivan himself was such... Uh, an icon and a grand old man of, uh, of television. He was he was quite forgetful. And one of the things that we remember was that he he asked us whether because we came from Australia. He asked us whether we knew this tennis player in South Australia who had won some matches in 1933. And we said, "What 1933? You know, we we weren't even born then. That was really amazing." And so. I think they cut that out of the out of the repeats of the show, but, but and it was lovely to be with a professional crew of uh, of technical TV people because we sang live. The whole thing was 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 mic'd up very very marginally, shall we say? We didn't have mics everywhere, and it, it gave us the chance to really feature ourselves, I suppose, as as we normally would in that wonderful environment. And the audience was fantastic. So everything was was perfect about that particular performance, I think. Oh, absolutely. I was 11 years old and I still uh, remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, and then on November 16th, 1965, you appeared at a Royal Command performance at the London Palladium before the Queen Mother. What was it like to meet her? Oh, she was wonderful, very gracious lady. And uh, as most people know, she she lived lived forever. A beautiful uh, event. We were again on the stage with some incredible luminaries. Uh, Jerry Lewis top the bill, and Hank Mancini was conducting the orchestra. And oh boy, it was um, Sammy Davis Jr. was was on the bill. And but the highlight, Harvey, I've got to say, and this is this is something that your producer uh, uh, Stephen Silver might uh, relate to in the sense of a football team. It was that was that was the year that the that the English football team uh, won the World Cup, and they were the, the secret guest. So suddenly, in the middle of the of the performance, the curtains went up, and there was the English team standing behind, and the audience just went absolutely mad for them. Uh, and it was it was a, 
probably the highlight of the show. And perhaps Jerry Lewis and Sammy Davis Jr. maybe a, a, might have been a little bit jealous, really, that, that that happened. It was a fun night. What a memory. Now, yeah. on March the 12th, 1967, the Seekers performed at the Music Bowl in Melbourne, accompanied by the Australian Symphony Orchestra. The concert was attended by over 200,000 people, and the Guinness Book of World Records listed it as the greatest attendance at a concert in the Southern Hemisphere. What does it feel like, Keith, performing in front of a crowd of that size? Oh, boy, the lead up to it was amazing, Harvey, because we had arrived at the at the bowl, the, Maya, the Sydney Mayan Music Bowl in the morning, and the, the crowd had already started to come in. And we, it was a really hot day, and the, the heat was sort of shimmering off the off the uh, audience. And we were in the dressing room, and then they said, "Look, come round to the outside broadcast uh, TV box and a room, and and have a look at what's happening." Because they had a helicopter in the air, and they and they showed us this this vision of the of the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl being filled with these people and and police had to stop traffic miles away and uh, so that people uh, then went on foot to get to the bowl but going out on stage uh, and it's uh, there are many youtube videos about this now as well but going out, out on stage <clears throat> was a was an incredible experience because there we there we were suddenly uh, with this massive orchestra behind us and a choir Seeing this sea of faces, it was just unbelievable because all you could see was humanity. It was just incredible. Now, as you know, your hit song, Georgie Girl, was nominated for an Academy Award. And I remember being shocked when Mitzi Gaynor sang the song on the award show instead of you. Why yes. weren't you the ones to perform the song? Well, we were shocked that Mitzi Gaynor performed it for another reason, of course. But the the... The main reason was that uh, our manager, Eddie Jarrett, he was a lovely man, but he was very, what should we say, English-centric. And he booked us a long way in advance. So we had been committed to this pantomime over uh, the Christmas period and uh, in 1967, and that was an unbreakable contract. So up comes the, uh, the, the nomination for the, for the award, and we're sort of in, in Bristol, in, in England, performing our little pantomime while Mitzi Gaynor was singing, uh, singing the song Georgia Girl. And what a performance that was. I mean, how anyone could take Georgia Girl and create what Mitzi, the producers created is beyond me, I've got to say. It was the <laughs> Las Vegas version of Georgia Girl, I think. Don't you think? I think so. uh, it may have been the lost ver uh, Vegas version as well, actually. <laughs> so. Now, you know, um, a lot of people may not realize that your hit song, Someday, One Day, was written by Paul Simon, and it was his first hit song as a composer outside of Simon and Garfunkel. Did you have much contact with him, Keith? Yeah, I, I had limited contact with him, but Bruce Woodley had more contact. And in fact, Bruce and, uh, and Paul wrote a couple of songs, a couple of which we recorded, in fact. And uh, that was at a time when Paul Simon had just come over to London to try his luck. He and Art Garfunkel had just broken up, and I'm talking about 1960, early 1965 now. And he was introduced to us by our uh, publicist, and uh, he and Bruce got on very well at that time, and they as I say, they wrote a couple of songs and they wrote the, the big hit Rub, uh, Red Rubber Ball, which became a huge hit for the circle, but uh, should have been our hit, but we, we only put it on an album. Anyway, some, getting back to Sunday, one day, he decided that he would like to write, uh, this is Paul Simon, decided that he would like to write a song for us and he came up with Sunday, one day and it, and it seemed to fit our, our vocal style really well. I think uh, lately uh, he's tended to what shall we say, bypass those particular days and those songs in favour of the more recent works and albums that he's done. Now, of course, we all know that Judith Durham decided to leave the group in 1968. Do you personally think that she ever regretted that decision? I don't think she regretted the decision at all. No, I think she was really rather looking forward to going back to being a solo performer again, because that's what she was when we 
when we approached her. And we had this arrangement in within the four of us that if any of us wanted to leave, that we'd give the others six months' notice. And, and indeed, that's exactly what Judith did. So we had six months to to contemplate what we were going to do. And it was only because the BBC came up with a concept of doing a television show with the group that we decided to bring the BBC into our confidence and say, look, this is what's going to happen. You know, we're going to, we're going to be breaking up in three months or something like that by that time. And they said, well, can we make the farewell the disbanding of the group as part of that television show, which we agreed to. So that was that was done. It caught you know caught everybody completely by surprise because we knew the secret, but the general public didn't know. But as far as uh, Judas' feelings are uh, on the night, I mean, we we got together for the after party, and it was a very joyous affair. There were no recriminations. There was there's no animosity. It was all it was all very, very loving and uh, and upbeat. And uh, of course by that time Judith had had met her future husband, Ron Edgeworth, and the two of them decided that they were going to make music together. So in in some ways she wasn't going to going back to being a solo performer, but they were they became a duo. So I don't think she had any regrets about that. But but later on we kept in touch a lot. I, I used to you know, I used to see her in America when we visited there, and and yeah, we kept in touch. So it wasn't as though there was this falling off a cliff kind of a disbanding of the group. Well, after she left, she was replaced <laughs> over the years by several singers, including yeah. uh, Louisa Wisling. Cheryl yep. Webb, Julie Anthony, Karen Knowles, but nobody, in my opinion, nobody seemed to be able to measure up to that unique, distinctive timber in Judith's voice. Isn't that amazing? Well, it is amazing, and uh, the the when you mention all those all those singers, each of them had had her own individual tone and and uh, vocal abilities, and and uh, were remarkable in their own right. But of course. It was one of those situations when sometimes comparisons are inevitable, but they don't really serve any purpose because uh, we were bringing out new music as well at that time with those with those singers. So we were we were progressing the the the, the group anyway, as as the the name the seekers, and because Athel and, and Bruce and I were 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 the cornerstones of the uh, of the whole operation. That 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 worked quite well. Well, in 2019, after Judith retired, instead of replacing her with another female singer, you made the decision to add Michael Cristiano to the group, which you called the Original Seekers, and you recorded a wonderful album called Back to Our Roots, which contains songs the group was singing before Judith joined the group. It's just a great album. I'm wondering, are there any plans for the four of you to make another album? No, there are not. No, I think we... We looked at that project as as a single project, and that's the way it turned out. We didn't have too many songs left over that, <laughs> that didn't cut the uh, cut the mustard, shall we say? So uh, no, the short answer is no, because we've we've all got other things to do, and and it was such fun. I've got to say, being in the studio with with a male voice uh, being the fourth member, and that was a. a Exactly, getting back to what I was saying about when Ken Ray was in the group, because we were a, a four male uh, quartet uh, before uh, and calling ourselves the Seekers before Judith joined us. Well, now, as you know, your 1969 greatest hits album, The Best of the Seekers, spent six weeks at number one in the UK and actually managed to knock the Beatles' White album off of the charts. And it prevented the Rolling Stones' Beggar's Banquet album from going to number one. That Greatest Hits album spent a total of 125 weeks in the charts in the UK. You were even more popular in the UK than you were in the United States. Did that surprise you? Well, it certainly caught us off guard because we had no idea that that, that legion of fans was uh, was still out there because, as I said, having having broken up on that, on that television show, the BBC show, Farewell the Seekers, it just seemed like, we were going our, our, our own way and um, keeping in touch, of course, but going our own way. And then to have that album just be such a, a, a stunning success 
uh, caught us all off guard. And uh, I guess that we were maybe from time to time, we might have thought, well, what if we stuck together? But then, but then that's the way history works. Yeah, it's true. In 1997, The Seekers released a platinum selling album called Future Road, which features four songs that you either wrote or co-wrote. Guardian Angel Guiding Light, The Circle of Love, Forever Isn't Long Enough, and the title track, Future Road. Keith, was that album kind of a turning point for you as a songwriter? Very much so, because I had been slow to start. Uh, Bruce Woodley had had kicked it off uh, in the 60s and uh, and Judith followed soon after. But I, I I took a while to come around to writing songs that the Seekers could record. I was probably writing other songs. I had uh, some success in, in when I was living in England, writing uh, other material, including resurrecting, should I use that word, Dwayne Eddy's career by writing or co-writing Play Me Like You Play Your Guitar, which was in 1974. But that was that's another story. As far as Future Road is concerned, yeah, I was I was really thrilled and honoured that the rest of the group liked enough of my songs to to put them on that album. Oh well, they're great songs. I'm wondering what drives your creativity as a songwriter. Oh, in some ways, there's no driving really. It just seems to kind of flow out like a like a spring, a, a creek, or you know that that feeds a pool of um, whatever. Uh, if that's a, a metaphor for uh, for a song, you can you can uh, have a, a pool and you drop the stone and the ripples flow out, and that's that's how these things happen for me. It may be for other people other, that that they're driven to write a song every day or whatever the case may be. But no, i my my songwriting happens just pretty much out of the blue. There's a musical theater production called Georgie Girl, The Seekers Musical, which had successful runs in Melbourne, Sydney, and Perth before the pandemic. Are there any plans to bring that musical to England or to America? Well, the current plans, we're taking it in easy steps, actually, Harvey, and I'm glad you mentioned that musical because now what we're doing is creating what could be called the school production or the the extra rights type of production so that we will be giving theatre groups and schools, etc., the, the, the ability to, uh, to to gain the rights for their own production. So who knows? It could be somewhere in, in America, Canada, UK, Australia, wherever. Georgia Girl, the musical may well pop up. I think the time is right. I can't wait. And I will be in the front row if it comes to America. I guarantee you that. I I understand that during the pandemic, you formed a band called Lightfeet that paid tribute to Gordon Lightfoot. Did you enjoy that experience? I did indeed. Yes. And I just happened to have a a copy of the, 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 that's, that's the little EP that we made, Lightfeet. We all enjoyed it. Hugely, actually. And uh, two of my really good pals from Canberra, Fred Pilcher and Gary Luck, were the other two members of our little trio. And we did some concerts. And Gary Luck is a, a Gordon Lightfoot tragic. I mean, he, he knows so much about, about Gordon Lightfoot. And he was, the, uh, he was the driving force, if you could call it that, in uh, putting the whole venture together. But yeah, we had a lot of fun and did some concerts. And, but then, uh, again, we found that we, uh, we had other, other things to do. And so we haven't performed for a, uh, about uh, 15 months now. You know, I was looking at your website, Keith, and it describes you as a wandering minstrel and a random singer. Why did you choose those words to describe yourself? I, well, I, I've always considered myself a, a wandering minstrel because uh, that's been me uh, with me and my guitar, you know, that sort of thing. And so I I added the, uh, the other bit, the random singer, because I tried to update my Wikipedia page. And I don't know if you know, the, the, the Wikipedia people have these editors and I have invented a word called minonym. That's another story, but minonym is, uh, uh, and so I tried to introduce this word into my page, but because it was me doing it, the, the, the editors got back to me and rejected my application to put this word minonym into my page. And the, the one of the, one of the critiques uh, said something to the effect of, and here's this, uh, here's this musician, random singer, wanting to try to update his page. And I thought, random singer, that, that's really good. So I kind of stole it. So thank you, Wikipedia. That's it. Yeah. But I've, 
But uh, and minimum, just to finish that story, minimum is uh, my the word I've coined to be a word that describes something, a phrase or a word that can be said frontwards or backwards. So, you know, so minimum, the current word is palindrome, which cannot be said in both ways. So I thought, uh, because we've got the words like synonym and antonym, etc., all those inonyms, uh, uh, that I, I suddenly realised that if I just changed the S on synonym to M, it would become minonym. And that's what I'm trying to promote. So there you go. You can help me. Is, is that going to turn into a song somehow? <laughs> It'll have to be a song that can be sung backwards. That's the only problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, in recent years, you mentioned your guitar. You've taken up playing the ukulele and you wrote a song called Make Every Day a Ukulele Day. What was yeah. it about the ukulele that attracted you? Oh, that's and that's the uh, CD, Make Every Day a Ukulele Day. Well, the ukulele has been a an instrument that's been in my background because my father played the banjo ukulele. And that was one of the first instruments that I ever heard and heard him play. And I love that sound. And again, it's, uh, it's, it's just has that happiness associated with it. Uh, you know, it's a, there are very few melancholy songs that are done on the ukulele. It's generally a very upbeat sort of instrument. So my, my partner, Elizabeth Hawks uh, and I have a, a mutual friend, uh, Rick Plum, who uh, was the bass guitarist in an Australian glam rock group called Hush. And he plays the bass ukulele. Elizabeth plays the tenor, I play the baritone. So the three of us got together and we wrote Make Every Day a Ukulele Day. And it's available somewhere. Your versatility is just astounding. Now, as you know, there have been a number of documentary films and TV shows about the Seekers, and one of the best is from an Australian TV show called Australian Story, and it's available oh, yeah. on YouTube. But I'm <laughs> yeah. wondering, Keith, do you have any interest in sitting down and writing a memoir? I have thought about it, but Athel Guy has written his memoir, and I'm going to try and help him promote that because uh, I want to make sure that he gets the stories right. <laughs> and so I think that, that one, one of these days I'll get together with Athel and we'll sit down in a, in a concert format and, and chat about it. But as far as a memoir of mine is concerned, I, I'm actually contemplating getting a book together with just the, the, the lyrics of my songs. And I've, I've written lots of songs and the lyrics in some way could perform as a memoir, if I get the right visuals together. And my, my partner, Elizabeth, she, she's a graphic designer. So we've been mulling over this idea of, of putting together a book with, with lyrics and images and, uh, and making that the best I can do as far as a memoir is concerned. Perhaps, perhaps a few little anecdotes here and there to, to fill in the gaps, if you like. But, uh, but we haven't really progressed it very far. It's a wonderful idea. Uh, maybe you... And Athel should co-author that book together. Well, yes, that's that's a thought too. But of course, because he has his own, I I really wanted to make sure that that uh, his gets gets as much light and uh, and importance placed on it as possible. Well, when his book is ready to be released, please let him know that he's more than welcome to come on our show. As you know, I'm a huge, huge fan of the Seekers. That's great. That's great. I will. I'll pass that on. Now, you're too humble to mention this, Keith, so I'm going to, that you've been actively involved with a number of charities throughout your life. You were a patron of the Variety WA Children's Charity for almost 10 years. You're on the board of directors of the Support Act Limited, which is the Music Industry Benevolent Fund. You're a patron of the Motor Neuron Disease Association of Western Australia, and you're a celebrity ambassador for Variety Victoria and Variety International. Tell me about the importance to you as a human being of giving back to the community because you've done it so, so much. Yeah, I, I think it comes from my, my upbringing that, that we had moved from where I was born in Ceylon to Australia and the Australians were, were very welcoming to us and uh, we wanted to, we as a family, I'm saying now, wanted to give back to that community. And I think that I, I, I've always followed that credo that there's giving and taking and it's better to start by giving and, and then let whatever happens after that. But 
the, there's um, I, I'm a I'm a firm believer in tithing, at the very least, of uh, of being able to to give and and those charities that you've mentioned have have been so much a part of my my group life, my musical life that uh, it's it's almost like an extension of of, of performing. And I, I'm doing a, a, a charity gig in two days' time, actually, for uh, an Australian Legacy, which is which is a wonderful, wonderful charity. It just happens, I suppose. I, I I get involved, and I like to I like to be a giver rather than a taker. That's right. You're not just a seeker; you are a giver in a big, big way. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Keith Potker by his music and see his concert schedule by going to his official website. KeithPotker.com. Well, Keith, I only have one more question for you, and it's this. Do you get, I mean, deep down inside, do you really get how beloved you and the other members of the Seekers are by music lovers everywhere? Does that, has that penetrated you? Well, it, it's, it's very difficult, Harvey, to answer that question because we're, uh, we as a group, and I have to speak as a group now, we as a group were, were always very aware of the fact that we could walk down the street if we needed to and not be besieged, but we would be respected. And that was, that was a, huge, a huge bonus to us as individuals as well as being group members because it, it meant that we could have wonderful conversations, not just perform in front of an audience, but have wonderful conversations with members of our audience. And that that made it really gratifying, I think, for all of us. For me personally, I am at, in a community in a little town in New South Wales, close to our capital city. The town's called Braidwood. And uh, just recently, the ABC, our local Australian Broadcasting Commission, did a whole program on our town, and it was wonderful to be part of that community. So, really, uh, what what I'm getting to, I suppose, is the fact that. It comes back to me as a as a great as a great warmth that there are uh, people out there in the world who still recognise the seekers, honour the seekers, and are pleased to think that they can come up to me and and have a chat, and I can have a chat with them as well. So it's it's a it's a two way street. But the thing about being a musician of the caliber that you and your colleagues are is that your music is eternal. It's immortal. It'll go on long after all of us are gone. What does that feel like? Well, it, it feels uh, amazing. And, and for, for the basis of that comment, I, I think we'd have to thank Tom Springfield, who, who uh, created so many incredible songs for us and produced all our stuff. I mean, uh, he didn't write Morning Town Ride, mind you, but uh, that was Malvina Reynolds. But there were other songs that, uh, that he didn't write as well, but he produced... Uh, music, inclu including writing and, and recording your favorite song, Walk With Me. So there you are. I love that song. Well, Keith, it's been a huge honor having this opportunity to celebrate your life and career on our show. Thank you for the beautiful music, for all the joy you've brought to your millions of fans around the world all these years. And thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, it's been my pleasure, Harvey, and thank you for uh, for having me. That's, that's great. And Perhaps we can do it again sometime. Who knows? Well, when Athel's book comes out, please yeah. come back with him. You are always welcome on our show. Excellent. Excellent. I'll tell him. Okay. Thank you. Our guest has been the legendary musician, songwriter, vocalist, and founding member of the superstar vocal group, The Seekers, the one and only Keith Potker. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. And a very special thank you to my dear friend, Lynn Santer. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.